Protests in Kanu State as residents and NNPP supporters reject tribunal judgment which sacked Governor Yusuf Abba. And Lagos Election Petition Tribunal dismisses Jandor and Rhodes Viva's case confirms someone lose victory. This is Plus Politics and I am Mary Ann O'Conn. Some residents of Kano State took to the streets to protest against the judgment of the election petition tribunal which sacked Governor Yusuf Abba as winner of the 2023 gubernatorial poll in the state. The Kano State Governorship Election Petitions Tribunal sacked Abba and further withdrew the certificate of return presented to him by the Independent National Electoral Commission and declared the All Progressive Congress APC candidate Nasser Gawuna winner of the March 18 governorship polls. As a result, some residents have gone to the streets protesting the verdict by the election petition tribunal. Joining us live in the studio to discuss this is Sanusi Bature. He's the chief press secretary to the governor of Kanu State. And also joining us is Ladikwa Johnson, who is a national, acting national spokesperson for the New Nigeria People's Party, NNPP. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. Good evening. Thank you for having us. Good evening. Great. Let me start with you, Mr. Baturi. Let's look at the case and the judgment. Um, many people would say that they did not see this coming, knowing what they know. Um, because of the Quancosia movement, some people would say that they, they thought that you, know, you had a sealed case. But there are also people who say you should have seen it coming. Well, um, the reality of the matter is that winning election is not a day job and there are some factors that contribute to winning election. Part of which in Kano is the grassroots mobilization of the Concorsia movement under the platform of NNPP, which brought His Excellency Elijah Abakabir Yusuf into power on the March 18th gubernatorial elections. Uh, in the first place, the party has been uh, into the limelight after Senator Rabi Musa Konkoso exited the PDP and they come to the NNPP in March 2022. And it has been an operation of one year and he made the party very, very popular. And particularly in Kano, we were able from zero to somewhere because we don't have a councillor, we don't have a local government chairman, but we were able to get 18 House of Representatives out of 24. Huh. We are also able to get two out of three senators in the first election, and we're able to have the highest votes of the uh, presidential election to conquer so in Kano at that time, close to a million votes, leading both Tunubu and Atiku. And for the second election in March 18, which is the gubernatorial, we have 40 state House of Assembly. So NNPP got 26 out of the 40, while APC is having 14, PDP is having none. And for the governorship election, we won with a wide margin of over 126 votes. And um, Abba Kabir Yusuf is the only governor in Nigeria during the 2023 election to win election with over a million votes. So he is the governor with the highest vote in Nigeria. So therefore, we have never expected that there will be a time because some people feel intimidated by the NNPP, and some people have been intimidated by what he started within the first 100 days in office. They feel like Kano is too important to be left in the hands of the opposition. So therefore, what happened at the uh, tribunal is an unfair judgment, lopsided, and we're going to challenge it at the appeal court. We're very, we're pretty sure that the appeal court and the Supreme Court will obtain this judgment because uh, the yearnings of the people of Kano said need to be represented and there have been clear evidences that there's no reason to cancel the 165 votes from the over a million votes uh, that the NNPP got at the gubernatorial election. 
if you mention the issue, the reason, the court said, first of all, one of the grounds for, for this petition is that APC is challenging the status of His Excellency Abba Kabir Yusuf as a member of the NNPP. And by law, this is a pre-election matter. Mm. And even at a pre-election matter, APC as an opposition party does not have the ground to challenge us. That can be challenged by only a member of NNPP who contested, who probably contested election along with At His the Excellency. Okay. Exactly. But in our case, His Excellency contested on a post because there was a consensus and he emerged victorious at the consensus. And then what we did was affirmation. We did affirmation in June 2022 at Sana Avacha uh, uh, Youth Center. And then he was affirmed by all the delegates, including the party stakeholders at the state level. Mm -hmm. So therefore, there's no contention about that. But APC came to challenge that status. And the court at the preliminary level said it doesn't have jurisdiction to take care of such issue. But on the other way around, they still say if they have the ground, they will declare him not a member of the NNPP. That's aside because it doesn't really affect the status of the judgment. Mm -hmm. But the other issue that affected the status of the judgment is the issue of removing of 165,000 votes from our boat, which is uh, over 1 million votes. So even at that, APC claimed that there are some unstamped ballot papers, there are those that are not signed by the presiding officers, and those that are not uh, uh, dated. So the Electoral Act as amended, 2022 as amended, clearly spelled out the reason for accepting an unstamped ballot paper because Section 63, subsection 2 of the Electoral Act clearly said that as far as uh, unstamped ballot paper or dated or undated or unsigned ballot paper is concerned, as long as the presiding officer is able to justify that that ballot paper is from the ballot, uh, the, the ballot bunch mm -hmm. supplied by INEC, which is, an, which is the electoral umpire. So therefore, that shall be counted. It shall be counted. So where are the agents of the APC at that time that they couldn't challenge that unsigned ballot paper at the polling station? And then APC said in their petition that they are going to provide thousands of witnesses to testify before the court on some of the evidences presented before it. But they were able to present only 32 uh, uh, witnesses. And even those 32 witnesses, at the level of cross-examination, our lawyers were able to challenge them and were able to make them denounce some of their deposition of uh, evidences. Interesting. Uh, Mr. Johnson, let me bring you in here. Still talking facts of the case. He's, he's told us most of it. Um, so legally, especially if you are defending a case such as this, um, in making sure that you prove these votes and the cancellation. Um, the burden is on the APC, I guess, in this case, to provide all the witnesses from all the polling units. Was this done? No, it wasn't. Um, the, the, the petition itself by the APC was um, a petition based on overvoting, violence, etc. And of course, the ballots that were presumably not stamped or what have you. Um, for you to prove um, in the, Niger, the Nigerian law has established that each polling unit is independent. You have to show what happened at that polling unit. And it must be done by someone, presumably an agent or someone that was there at the polling unit. Now you challenged over a thousand polling units and you only brought 32 people to court. So automatically you know that they have, there is no way they could have proven widespread um, violence. violence or what have you. Um, <clears throat> but then um, the panel did what it did. It um, decided in its own wisdom. Um, but 
Another thing that is um, worrisome is the fact that um, uh, people have said, people at the tribunal, have um, legal practitioners at the tribunal, have said that um, these ballots came in, or the so-called unsigned ballots, were tendered from the bar, not from a witness in the witness book, box. And so the NMPP had no opportunity to cross-examine, meaning that they had no fair hearing regarding that aspect of it. So normally, there ha normally your party, um, party's attorney is supposed to see um, this particular evidence, and it should not be tendered by a lawyer. It should be from, oh, from a witness. Yes, ordinarily such a thing would be tendered by a witness. Most um, logically it ought to have come from the person in whose custody it was, which was INEC. That, that would be the natural thing. And INEC was joined in this petition. <clears throat> yes, it was INEC joined in was this a petition. Defendant as well. Okay. So you would have expected the INEC officer to tender, we've had um, 165,000 so, so, so ballots that we haven't, that wasn't stamped or whatever. We would have been able to say, okay, based on section 83, and the 63 too, would have then been able to ask them that, okay, you had them. Why did your presiding officer count? Did it come out of the pad of um, um, ballot papers, etc., etc., etc.? That way, you would have had a more holistic thing about those ballots. Can I ask? Yeah. Um, I've covered elections, so I, I pro probably have a fair knowledge of how these things work. Before those ballot papers are given out, the INEC official shows them to the agents, exactly. right? Exactly. And, and these agents have to either agree or disagree exactly. before you know, the process begins. Yeah. Do you know if this was done? Well, it was done. Most likely it was done. And even when it's been sorted, the agents are there. When you empty the box, when you sort the ballots, they're there. They look at it. Then you start taking one, NMPP, one, APC, one, PDP. They're there. They didn't object. So all of a sudden, you now come up with this um, point. That is why a lot of people, law professors, different people, if you read the opinion pages in newspapers, are uh, all um, up in arms about this judgment. It really makes no sense to a lot of us. Are you implying um, that these judges were, they swung this judgment in favor of the APC? Are you implying that the bench is biased? Well, not necessarily. I am saying that um, they have brought about a miscarriage of justice either by not averting their minds to 63-2 or by just um, negligence. On the other hand, many are implying, not like Paul Johnson, many are implying that with the surrounding facts, the optics we have, etc., that they are not comfortable with how they arrived at their decision. You understand? I will not say that they swung it for the APC or for any side um, based on bias. <laughs> but one issue, you will recall if you've read it, that one of the judges went on to cast aspersions in source at members of the NNPP, calling us bandits, um, terrorists, and calling us a cult. Now, with that, I can make bold to say that, oh, that man was prejudiced. Interesting. Let's put a pin there. Let me come back to you, um, Mr. Baturi. Let's talk about the government now. Many people are worried that with this, you know, um, happening, uh, it might be a distraction from governance. It might not allow the governor to, you know, continue.
with what he's done. Uh, in that same um, breath, I want to ask, um, it's 100 plus days for your governor in office, even though this verdict has been given. Um, what can the Yusuf administration say they've done in the few days that it's been in office? Well, um, the 100 days have been a very successful uh, uh, days of the administration of the engineer Abakabir Yusuf. <clears throat> Why I say this is because of the laudable projects and achievement, milestone achievement he was able to record. Uh, the judgment did not in any way distract him because even a day after the judgment, he held the state weekly executive council meeting where he approves a lot of projects and he continued to do whatever necessary to ensure that Kano is uh, under a serious uh, 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 administration. So within the 100 days, let me give an example of what he achieved in education because education has been his priority number one, number two, and number three. So you remember the issue, and I have seen it in the news here in Lagos, that um, there is a fear. A lot of students will drop out from the university because of the hike in the tuition fees. So in Kano, the story is different because His Excellency has directed that the Ministry of Higher Education should pay for 100% uh, uh, tuition fee for 7,000 students of Kano indigents studying at Bayer University, which is the only federal university in the state. And for over 10 state-owned tertiary institutions within the state, which include two state-owned universities, His Excellency directed that instead of increasing like what other states are doing, he said the current tuition fee before the forced subsidy removal should also be reduced to 50%. So some people that are studying NCE diploma, you see them paying less than 10,000 naira per session, and some in the university, you see them paying just 10,000 plus per session. So it's very easy in Kano. And apart from that, he also reintroduced the foreign scholarship program, which was started by Senator Rabi Musa Konkosu. By October, 1,001 first class holders will defer Nigeria to 14 different countries to study master's degree in different fields. And also, he has settled 1.6 billion naira, which is uh, the payment for the payment of uh, senior secondary school examination, NECO in particular, for the previous and this year's candidates. So he has settled that a uh, uh, few few months ago, and then he ordered the reopening of the 26 institute of, for skill accusation because we're suffering from uh, uh, unemployment. And for you to get us out of that unemployment thing, you need to provide the youth with the skills. So there were six, 26 institutions that are mainly designed to provide on-the-job training, fishery, animal feeds, agri mechanization, film industry, development journalism, entrepreneurship, a lot of fields. So those institutes were closed by Ganduja administration and they have not operated in the last eight years. On assumption, His Excellency directed that all of them should be reopened and admission should start immediately so that people will be enrolled, will be trained and startup capital will be given to them to be doing uh, uh, business in different uh, areas. Uh, part of those 26 institutions, there is uh, a reformatory institute Okay. Which take care of the drug addicts because, you know, if you look at I the I was going to ask about, you know, what the government is doing in that regard because yeah. there's been, not look, just in Kanu, but yeah. then across the... I think I've asked you that question before yeah. you about know, the drug You know, the, the indices for drug abuse does not favor Kanu in any way in the last 10 years, I can say. Uh, because a lot of the youths, male and female, have engaged themselves into the issue of drug abuse. So His Excellency set up a tax force and then he opened the reformatory uh, institute. So they will be reformed, trained, and they will be given either job, depending on, or some will be taken to school. If they have the quali required qualification, they will be taken to university or polytechnics or colleges of education. And some of them will be given startup capital to start any business of their choice so that they can be proud of themselves and mm -hmm. their families can be proud of them. And then as, an, as a professional in the water industry, 
uh, Kano, especially the metropolitan area, has suffered a lot in terms of the scarcity of uh, potable water. Okay. So within the 100 days, most of the metropolitan area are now being supplied with the potable water, almost everywhere, because he has uh, repaired most of the water treatment plants and uh, he appointed uh, all the necessary MDAs under the Ministry of Water Resources and those are experts. You know, that is his own area. He's an expert in water in resources water. Mm -hmm. and yes, so it's an area that he has so much interest. So we were able to achieve a lot in the um, issue. And now he's going into the rehabilitation of dams so that we can have the available water for irrigation so that the state will be will maintain its status in having the all year round production of agri produce. agriculture. Yeah. Let me bring, come back to the politics of this whole case. It was reported that uh, one of your commissioners um, threatened the judge. Um, although we hear that your governor has, um, you know, let him go, but then many would ask why, what gave this commissioner the temerity to speak on behalf of your administration? Because, but, I mean, he may not have been speaking on behalf of the governor, yeah. but then he's a representative First of, all, of your I government. I want people to understand that um, my governor, my principal, is a no-nonsense man. And uh, that commissioner does not represent the governor, is not a commissioner for information, and is not a, a spokesperson to the governor in any way. It's a commissioner for land and physical planning. Uh, somewhere, somehow, uh, he got interviewed by some social media activists, and he made that statement. And the governor, as a chief security of the state, cannot in any way condone such uh, uh, unguarded utterances. So therefore, he immediately fired the commissioner so that, because we believe an official to that caliber should not be seen making such utterances because it relates to the security, peace and security of the state. So therefore, uh, the governor needs to be appreciated for taking a proactive measure immediately because a few hours after the statement, His Excellency has issued a statement saying that um, he relieved the commissioner out of his appointment immediately. Mm. Yep. Finally, Mr. Mr. Johnson, before we go, because we're out of time, um, how long would, before we see the NMPB back in court to you know, challenge this decision and the verdict? I believe that um, the um, notice of appeal must have been filed by now. Um, so once that is done, the appeal entered, then the briefs of appeal will be um, asked for. Um, we will file our written brief, um, appellant's brief, and the respondents will file the respondent's brief. And I believe that um, if there are no um, interim matters to be sorted out, that um, the appeal will be heard. Um, okay. Well, we'll look forward to that. Sanusi Bature is the Chief Press Secretary to the Governor of Kano State, and Ladikpa Johnson is the Acting National Spokesperson for the New Nigeria People's Party. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being here. Thank, Thank you, Mary. All right. We'll take a break. When we come back, we will be looking at the re verdict from the Lagos State um, Tribunal. Stay with us.